on behalf of the Newark Public Library, Director Jocelyn Bowling Dixon, and the Library's Board of Trustees, welcome. I'm Tom Ankner, the Supervising Librarian in charge of the Charles F. Cummings New Jersey Information Center here at the Main Library. Tonight, we have what promises to be an exciting program from the Newark History Society. We are proud to host this event and to co-sponsor it with the Medical History Society of New Jersey. Uh, just to get a few housekeeping items out of the way, the restrooms are out just outside this door and to the left. Uh, the Newark History Society is providing food for those of you who came out tonight. Please help yourselves if you have not already. Uh, we ask that you hold your questions to the end when our speaker will be fielding inquiries from those of you here in Centennial Hall, as well as those watching on Zoom and Facebook Live. Uh, those of you who are participating remotely, please type any questions or comments in the chat box. So uh, we will get to as many as possible after our speaker's talk. And now to introduce our speaker, it is my pleasure to introduce Timothy J. Christ. Tim is the president and co-founder of the Newark History Society. He is also a longtime member, former president and current treasurer of the Newark Public Library's Board of Trustees. Tim. Thanks, Tom. And it's um, even during that introduction, the uh, number of people joining us on Zoom has been ticking up. We're out at 70 or more already on, on Zoom. So that's a good, um, a good response. Uh, this is our last Newark History Society program of the spring. We'll meet again in September, September 22nd, for a program made in Newark, uh, uh, recalling the 100th anniversary of the Newark Industrial um, Exposition in 1872. Um, you'll get information about that in, in advance. And then in November, we'll be celebrating our 20th anniversary, which is a little hard to believe. But tonight, we're really pleased to have Bob Vitragoski, who is the head of special collections. And I, let's see if I can get this right, uh, Bob, at the George F. Smith Library of Health Sciences at what used to be UMDNJ, it's all in Newark, but it's, it, it's now the Rutgers uh, Biomedical and Health Sciences. I got that, good. Uh, he, uh, Bob has been there as the head of special collections for the last 15 years. Uh, for the 10 years before that at Columbia University's Medical Center, got his uh, library degree at the University of Maryland. And one thing we share, he's a graduate of Yale, uh, class of um, uh, 17 years after me. Um, so, uh, but since 2008, he has been the editor of the Medical History Society of New Jersey and uh, of their newsletter. And I kind of get the impression, Bob, you're helping to keep that uh, together and to, uh, it's a fun group and they uh, have a regular programs and they, they're co-sponsoring our program tonight with the Newark History Society and the, uh, the Newark Public Library. And as I understand it, uh, Bob will tell us more in recent years, he's been looking into the career of Dr. Harrison Martland in, in more detail, following in the steps of Dr. Samuel Berg, who uh, wrote a biography of Harrison Martland, published in 1978. Uh, Samuel Berg is of, uh, uh, greatly honored in this building, in this library, because uh, when he died at age 92, in 1990, he left his entire estate to the, uh, to the Newark Public Library, including, and this is not the medical side, but uh, including, um, uh, Tom, is it hundreds or thousands of streetscape photographs that he systematically took of, of Newark uh, Street? Almost 2,000 photographs. They've all been digitized. They are on, up uh, online, but they're a marvelous resource for that captured Newark at a, at a point in time, uh, block by block uh, through the city. So, but tonight, um, Bob, we're delighted that you're here. Nice that you're a member of the Newark History Society as well as the Medical History Society of New Jersey. Welcome, and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's an honor to be speaking in this room where I myself have attended some memorable lectures. You mentioned you're coming up on the 20th anniversary of the Newark History Society. I was here for the 15th when this room was absolutely packed. Um, and uh, thanks to all those who are joining us online. I think. I think a few more people are online than in the audience. In fact, I think I was wondering if we should just introduce each other um, to start things off. But I'm really deeply grateful to be giving a talk in person uh, for the first time since really the start of the pandemic. 
before we start, just something on the slide. Um, this presentation is an evolving work done in partnership with Dr. Churway Stephanie Yun, um, who I met as a medical student and is now several years past being a medical student. And she's graduated from New York, uh, sorry, New Jersey Medical School. She started this project with me about five, six years ago. And yeah, we, we know we need to get our article done. And uh, before we begin, I just wanted, especially with a small group like this, I wanted to learn a little bit more about our audience here today. I actually know a fair number of you. So show of hands, and I don't know, maybe people online can put something in the chat. Are there any Sherlock Holmes fans here tonight? Okay, there's a decent about half raise. Are people here familiar more or less with the story of the Radium Girls? Radium Girls, okay, again, about half. Are there any football fans here? Even if you watch the Super Bowl just for the commercial. Yeah, okay. We have two hands up here. So we have some football uh, people in the audience. Okay, how many people here are radiobiologists? No radiobiologists, really? Okay, uh, how many of you then are forensic pathologists? Uh, none, I don't know. I don't know if this lecture is gonna work. We'll do it anyway. Um, well, the subject of tonight's talk uh, was a forensic pathologist who played a key role in the story of the radium girls and who made pioneering discoveries in human radiobiology as well as brain injury. A doctor who was compared to Sherlock Holmes and who happened to be a Sherlock Holmes fan himself, although he held some strong opinions on the difference between Sherlock Holmes fantasy and Essex County reality. And that's what I'll be talking about tonight. So let's start with a mystery. Here are your clues. It's the mid 1920s and something strange is happening. Young women in the greater New Orange, New Jersey area are going to see doctors and dentists with an unusual array of symptoms. They're presenting with anemia, fatigue, bruising for no reason, joint pain, leg, bone, hip pain, loose teeth, decaying gums, jaw necrosis. One goes to a dentist and in the examination, her jaw falls out, more Stephen King than Sherlock Holmes. Over the course of a few years, several die unpleasant deaths. No foul play is suspected, so no autopsies are performed. And the cause of death on the death certificates varies. Ulcerative stomatitis, syphilis, anemia, angina, sepsis, even gingivitis in one case. And then in 1925, a chemist, Dr. Edwin Lehman died. Dr. Edwin Lehman and the young women had something in common. They had all worked at one time or another at the United States Radium Corporation located in Orange, New Jersey. Does anyone uh, ever go to the Star Tavern, the famous pizza place? Okay, kind of right down the block from the Star Tavern is the site of uh, US Radium Corporations. It's not there anymore, that's a park. Um, but this is kind of a famous image, um, of uncertain copyright um, of women watch dial painters. So the women had been painters, the young women had been painters. U.S. Radium Corporation made luminescent watch dials, as well as luminescent clocks, instrument panels, glow in the dark, whatever. Business boomed during World War I when they were making submarine instrumentation and airplane instrumentation and all sorts of things. The paint was a proprietary formula created by a scientist named Dr. Sabin von Shahaki, who had combined zinc sulfide and other substances with a microscopic amount of radioactive radium-228, known as mesothorium. To achieve a precise line as they were painting their watch dials, the women licked the tips of their paintbrushes to maintain a fine point known as lip pointing. Okay. Now, I mentioned that the chemist died, and it's one of those ironic things, of course. Uh, no one's paying attention to the young laboring women dying, but when a professional man dies, there's a little more attention paid. And sure enough, an autopsy on Dr. Lehman was performed by the Essex County physician, Dr. Harrison Martland, who had just been elevated into that role with the unexpected passing of the previous Essex County physician. Uh, Dr. Martland was curious about the radiation elements in the story and knew something about this. And it actually even apparently had heard a little bit about uh, the mysterious situation with some of the girls. And he wanted to get an expert in and he went to Von Shahaki um, and asked for some help in evaluating uh, uh, the autopsy. And they came up with a way of trying to measure radiation into uh, uh, Dr. Lehman's uh, bones. So Martlin tested them by uh, basically burning his bones down to ashes um, and then measuring with an electrometer. I'm not sure, again, I'm not a radiobiologist. Um, uh, this is apparently the first time radiation had been measured within a human body. 
And both men believed, Von Schake and Marlin, believed that the cause of Lehman's death was the radioactive dust he had inhaled in his 14 years of working at U.S. Radium Corporation. Marlin and Von Schake next devised tests for, de to, for detecting radiation in living persons. Obviously, you cannot burn down the ashes of someone's bones when they're alive. So several former dial painters breathed into an apparatus to detect radiation uh, from radon gas. Their very breath was radioactive. Their very breath was a sign of incurable radium poisoning. In addition to the women, Von Schahaki himself tested his breath, and he too was radioactive, and he died about three years later. Now, Martlin was not the first to make the connections between the dead, dying, and ill women and the destructive health effects of radium encountered in their workplace. But his, I'm sorry, I need to jump a slide. But his pioneering research, publications over the next 15 years or so, and court testimony would help five of the so-called radium girls eventually settle a lawsuit against their former employer. Okay, so testing for radioactive materials within the human body in a deceased person, for radioactive materials within a living person, and then uh, you know his publications. And finally, he was reluctant to testify in court uh, in this lawsuit that the, that the women brought against the US Radium Corporation, because he kind of believed that no one really had an idea of how harmful this was. But he changed his mind and he actually did testify. He was apparently an incredibly damning witness uh, and was able to sort of, all right, so the, the, the radium girls settled out of court they, had, they went to trial. They, they were in the process of having testimony and so on. Um, and after Marlin's testimony, after this period of delay or so on, the, the company came back. It was like, we need to settle. Um, they settled for about $10,000 $10, per uh, radium dial painter of the five women, plus a pension of $600, plus their medical expenses. Um, the five women uh, died over the next decade or so. Um, so I'm going to show you another picture related to the radium girls. Um, it was a wild media sensation in the 1920s, mid 1920s on. And this is from Popular Science Monthly, you know, with the dramatic headline, doomed to die and they live. There's the five women. Um, the one on the left is Quinta McDonald, um, who came to Martland in 1925 to have her breath evaluated. A former watch dial painter, she had started feeling pain in her hips and had developed a limp. Marlin determined that she had developed radiation osteitis in both femurs and that she breathed out radium and mesothorium. Marlin would meet Quinta McDonald again, this time on the autopsy table. Uh, he excised a 15 centimeter right pelvic osteogenic sarcoma from her body and noted the extensive pulmonary metastases, which along with anemia had caused her death. Quinta McDonald, the fifth daughter, hence her name Quinta, uh, is buried at Rosedale Cemetery on the Montclair Orange Radio West Orange border, and her remains are still radioactive. Um, just to show you, though, briefly, here is an entry in the Encyclopedia of New Jersey about Martland's achievements in radiobiology. I have to read it off this. His international reputation came from decades of meticulous studies of radiation injury among New Jersey radium workers. He documented anemias, osteonecrosis, osteogenic sarcomas, and other malignancies caused by internally deposited radioactive materials, including the latent period between exposure and objective injuries. By 1925, in his earliest articles actually, he'd established how the human body absorbs, stores, metabolizes, and is harmed by radioactive alkaline earths, work still cited and never successfully challenged. And he did this again almost a century ago. Uh, just an additional comment to make here, Martlin went on to uh, do an exhibit on uh, atomic safety for the Oak Ridge uh, Laboratory in Tennessee in 1939 that uh, tens of thousands of people saw. And there's an argument that Martland helped uh, minimize death and injury during the Manhattan Project due, the, due to the kind of work that he'd been publishing for the previous 15 years on radiation safety. Now, my brief account today here only scratches the surface of the story of the Radium Girls. There's an entirely separate part that takes place in Ottawa, Illinois. Uh, and in fact, the Radium Girl story starts in Newark because uh, U.S. Radium Corporation had a branch in Newark. That could be its own Newark History Society talk. Um, but their story, now almost a century old, remains relevant in many branches of history. Women's history, labor history, legal history, history of medicine, and especially the history of occupational health and safety. And in our area, local history. For more information, I recommend Claudia Clark's academic book, Radium Girls, Women in Industrial Health Reform, 1910 and 1935, that was published in 1997. I also recommend Kate Moore's best 2017 bestseller, The Radium Girls, The Dark Story of America's Shining Women. 
Kate Moore is a wonderful writer and as well a wonderful person. As of this weekend, when I looked at it, her book has almost 10,000 ratings on Amazon and almost 114,000 ratings on the Goodreads website. So many, many people read this book. Now, what I wanted to add about that is Kate Moore came to Newark and did her research at my special, my institution's special collections. And right here in the Newark Public Library, Beth Zach Cohen is acknowledged in the, in the book. Um, and I believe that this book is by far the best-selling nonfiction book to come from research out of either collection. I don't know, if, Tom, you have another possible entry in that, but I, it's, yeah, this book sold a lot and it's really an important book. So now I'm gonna to jump to something different. So who was Harrison Martlin? Who was this doctor involved in this story? The first thing to say is that Dr. Harrison Martlin was one of Newark's own. And going back to his father, right? His father, William Martlin, was born in Massachusetts, raised in Illinois, fought in the Civil War as a young man. Sometime during his military service, he met William Harrison Stanford, who was a pharmacist from Newark. After William Martlin completed medical school at the University of Michigan and briefly practiced in Illinois, he and his wife Ida moved to Newark, probably at the suggestion of his friend Harrison Stanford, and eventually set up a home and medical office at 1138 Broad Street, where Dr. Martlin, Dr. William Martlin, had a half century long career as a prominent Newark physician. In their house on Broad Street, their son was born on September 10, 1883, and named Harrison Stanford Martland in honor of his friend. Young Harrison Martland, although no one called him Harrison apparently, he was Mart or Marty or for respect, Dr. Martland, okay? We'll use the Harrison though periodically here. Um, young Harrison Martland attending boarding, boarding school in Maryland and earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Western Maryland College in 1901. And he went on to earn a medical degree from the College of Physicians and Surgeons of the City of New York, known as PNS, which is Columbia University's medical school. He had a few brief professional appointments in New York City, but then he returned to his native Newark and became the first full-time pathologist of the Newark City Hospital in January 1909. In 1910, he married Myra Ferdin, literally the girl next door at 1140 Broad Street, uh, and Harrison and Myra bought a house at 180 Clinton Avenue in Newark, where they would raise two children and live for nearly the rest of Dr. Martin's life. And now I turn to his, uh, Dr. Martin's professional position. So he comes back to Newark to take the position, the first full-time paid pathologist at Newark City Hospital in 1909. And again, he's there for the rest of his career, essentially. He dies in 1954, we'll be getting to that soon. Um, he does leave to serve in the military in, in World War I. Um, he's assigned as director of laboratories to the Belleville Hospital Unit, Base Hospital Number 1, um, where he goes to Vichy, France for a year or so, um, a year and a half, um, and then returns again to Newark. Um, and really, that's the only time outside of, uh, uh, that's the only time he leaves Newark essentially as a home base between 1909 and his death. Um, then, as I mentioned at the beginning, he uh, served as Essex County physician between 1925 and 27. But as soon as he took that position, he began to argue uh, for the, uh, for, uh, an advance in professionalization. Um, there's a, a long story, I'm gonna again abbreviate really quick about uh, the coroner model, right, which is to have somebody who's a doctor or maybe someone in the community who's respected to act as a coroner in cases of non-natural causes or uncertain causes in death. But the coroner position was very much of a political machine position. It could be appointed. It was open to all, all whole ranges of abuse. Um, and Marland advocated as soon as he got the uh, county physician position for uh, an advancement to something that professionalized um, the, the uh, evaluation of death, um, and he succeeded. And so in 1927, he became the first Essex County medical examiner. Again, he held that position right up until uh, about a year before his death. Um, and at the time, only Boston, New York, and a few other places had medical examiners. Newark was really in the forefront of professionalizing this position. Um, in his role as pathologist and in his later role as medical examiner, uh, Martlin performed an unbelievable amount of autopsies. Um, his biographer, Dr. Samuel Berg, uh, notes in his book, estimates that in Martlin's 40-year career, Martlin performed or supervised approximately 30,000 autopsies, which would be an average of about 15 a week for 40 years. This is an unbelievable number um, and something that, again, in the modern world, autopsy is frankly uh, faded out a lot. Uh, this is an extraordinary uh, uh, time. And so with that in mind, I feel this is the right time to show you a photograph of Harrison Martland conducting an autopsy, okay? I hope no one finds this upsetting, 
I'm not trying to, uh, that's not my intention. Um, and it's not a very graphic or gory image. In fact, it's the one used on the flyer to promote this event, just cropped a little bit. Um, so you're gonna see an anonymous deceased person, but here you go. But as I say, it's, a, it's not graphic or gory, but it is shocking, okay? So here's the image. So the immediately shocking thing that you see, of course, is that he's smoking a cigarette, right? Um, he may have been doing that for reasons of smell. Uh, he was a, apparently an inveterate cigarette smoker. Um, because he's smoking a cigarette, you'll notice that he's not wearing a mask. Uh, in fact, he's not even wearing gloves. And this would be highly unusual and irregular. And yet in Samuel Berg's book, he says, this is how Martland did all of his autopsies. So you could say he was a very, a very hands-on pathologist. Um, you could say, you know, this is the kind of guy he was. Um, and leave it at that. Oh, I jumped back to the, the, uh, the corner. Uh, okay, and one other accomplishment as a result of his work as pathologist and medical examiner was that he ran a series known as the Clinical Patholo Pathological Conferences. Um, they began slightly after, actually he had started, there was kind of a proto version uh, out of a group called the Essex County Pathological and Anatomical Society founded in 1908 kind of almost coincident with Martin's uh, coming on board as a pathologist at New York City Hospital. But after World War I, basically on every Tuesday evening from then through the 1950s, Martin held this sort of uh, seminar, if you will, open to, low, open to any physicians, um, where cases were presented from New York City Hospital or the medical examiner's office or local physicians if they had some particularly interesting case. This went on for, as I said, decades. Um, Samuel Berg in his biography says the clinical pathological conferences you know, could be compared with a murder mystery that you went through the process of discussing, you know, essentially the evidence and so on, and people made their uh, assessments, and then the pathologist or Martlin would end with the conclusion of what really happened and so on. Um, the real point to make about this is New Jersey has a very odd history in terms of medical education. It's essentially more or less two centuries behind Pennsylvania and New York. Uh, and during this entire period, New Jersey did not have a medical school. Um, so Martin was essentially providing the only postgraduate medical education in New Jersey. Um, and it's really kind of an extraordinary, this is a, a real accomplishment for, for local medical history. Now, what's interesting also about these conferences is that uh, in April, April 26, 1951, Martin suffered a stroke during one of the conferences. Um, he convalesced and returned, um, but he was in sort of a decline for a couple of years. At the very end, he moved in with his uh, daughter and son-in-law in the Bronx. In Riverdale, and he died on May 1st, 1954. Um, so he was given a great honor in those later years, um, which is that they named the entire uh, Newark City Hospital, they renamed it in his honor. And this building that I'm sure many of you are very, very familiar with was in fact the Harrison S. Martland Medical Center at the time that it was built in 1957. What's interesting to note about this picture is you see the brown brick building behind it. That's the original Newark City Hospital. Okay, so that's the land on which um, that, that city hospital was located. I believe after 1901, that's the second building, but that's the city hospital. Eventually that gets knocked down itself and turned into a parking lot. But, you know, that's a great building that I think a lot of us are familiar with. Um, and here's the showing, again, this is a plaque in the lobby uh, by the elevators dedicated to the memory of Harrison Stanford Martland. There's a sign uh, showing that hospital name. Now you need a scorecard to know what the name of the building was, because after about 10 years, um, it we went back to being named Newark City Hospital. Then the medical school came in, Seton Hall Medical School moved to Newark, um, started up again and changed the name where it was the Marland Hospital unit of the New Jersey College of Medicine and Dentistry. Um, then it becomes College Hospital. Anyway, it goes on from there. Um, one last uh, image of the, of the building you'll see on top is the UMDNJ logo when it was UMDNJ's building, and then it was renamed in honor of the longtime UMDNJ president, Dr. Stanley S. Bergen. So it's the Bergen building. And then on the other side, you see with the Rutgers logo, which is what it is today. Um, so let me go back now. I've told you about the Radium Girls. I've given you the, bio, uh, the biographical story of Harris and Martin. Let me give you another example of Harris and Martin's mind at work. Um, in 1928, he published an article in JAMA, a major medical uh, journal, entitled Punch Drunk. Uh, and this is the opening lines of the article. For some time, fight fans and promoters have recognized the peculiar condition occurring among prize fighters, which in ring parlance they speak of as punch drunk. Fighters in whom the early symptoms are well recognized are said to be by, by the fans to be cuckoo 
Goofy, cutting paper dolls, or Slug Nutty. And he was discussing uh, what is now known as CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is a hot topic um, in football, in boxing, not just boxing and mixed martial arts, but a whole range of other sports as well, hockey, soccer, bull riding, and so on. And it's that constant sort of low level, if it, you know, you can have concussions in those events, but it's the constant low level head trauma that leads to a whole constellation of, uh, of uh, neurological symptoms that, that approach Parkinsonian walker, dementia, or so on. Um, Marlon was the first to write about this. What's interesting, again, is that he was writing about something that was uh, based on his uh, an occupational marker of health from boxers. And he was basing it on an observation that lay people had that, in fact, doctors did not have at the time. He comments on that later in the article. One sporting writer of note has recently stated that punch drunk was greatly exaggerated and that he consulted eminent neurologists who had assured him that such a condition did not exist. I have found that the opinion of shrewd laymen, many of whom are making a living by, earn, by observing the physical fitness actions and characteristics of the professional fighter is perhaps more substantial than the opinion of medical experts. So Marlon was very um, kind of engaged in, in his own work of investigation and deduction based on so on, which brings us again to the Sherlock Holmes portion of the story. At the time of, oh, I'm sorry, here, one more picture. This is an example, one would say, of, of the type of thing that you might see at a clinical pathological conference. But Marlon is actually lecturing on punch drunk. You see what he calls the danger zone. Uh, it's a formula up above for kinetic energy. Over his head are images of two boxers. And he's sort of casually resting his hand on presumably uh, the next uh, topic of discussion under the, under the table there. Um, but this, um, this comes from actually a Time Magazine film, March of Time, um, quite interesting. All right, so if you wanna know more, I should also say about punch drunk syndrome, um, an article came out in Brain in January, 2018, uh, written by a fourth year medical student at the time who graduated at that point, um, Dr. Abhinav Changa um, with his mentor, Dr. Peter Carmel, who's the chair of neurosurgery at uh, RBHS at University Hospital and so on, and another guy. Um, and then when, Mar when Martland finally retired in this post-stroke state, um, he, he was mentioned again as a Sherlock Holmes. So his retirement announcement in the New York Herald Tribune, Martland retires, right? Medical Sherlock Holmes, Martland radiation expert, retires as an examiner. And after he died in 1954, his obituary in the Journal of the Medical Science of New Jersey comes right out and says, his work as a crime detective attracted nationwide attention. In the field of scientific crime detection, he was a latter day Sherlock Holmes. Now, this is quite interesting for a bunch of reasons with, with Martland in particular. Um, well, okay, I'll jump to something else kind of first. Let's talk about something that's obvious, which is in general, doctors love Sherlock Holmes. Um, and Sherlock Holmes and the medical profession have been intertwined since the beginning. Dr. Arthur Conan Doyle began writing the Holmes stories during downtime at his practice in South Sea, England. Doyle based Holmes on his University of Edinburgh medical school professor, Dr. Joseph Bell. Uh, and almost all the home stories are narrated by Dr. John Watson. Not surprisingly, medicine appears throughout the 60 Sherlock Holmes stories and novels. A survey of the Sherlockian canon identified 68 diseases, 32 medical terms, 38 doctors, 22 drugs, 12 medical specialties, six hospitals, and even three medical journals and two medical schools. References to tobacco, opium, and cocaine are too numerous to count. Um, so there's this baseline affinity right from the, right from the creation um, and just as medicine appears in the Sherlock, in the Sherlockian literature, Sherlock Holmes appears in the medical literature. Uh, if you search Sherlock Holmes in PubMed, right, the largest database of medical literature, the broadest online guide to the medical literature, you receive nearly 200 results ranging over more than a century. And they, they have these titles like Sherlock Holmes is the curious case of the human locomotor center central pattern generator, or tumor induced osteomalacia, a Sherlock Holmes approach to diagnose and management. Um, White Coats and Fingerprints, Diagnostic Reasoning in Medicine and Investigative Methods of Fictional Detectives. Sherlock Holmes in Marine Biology Literature. That's because one of the Holmes stories has a death by jellyfish. Um, there's even, well, again, to give you an example of kind of what's in these articles that talked about the, the commonalities, right? It is essential for doctor to learn aspects of the detective's art. The commonalities between the work of the physician and Sherlock Holmes include observational skills, capacity for logical reasoning, 
knowledge, ability to reconstruct psychological and social profiles, and to conduct an interview, okay? There's even a subcategory of, in the medical literature of if Sherlock Holmes was a doctor, what kind of doctor would he be, right? So you have Sherlock Holmes in pediatrics, Sherlock Holmes neurologist, today Sherlock Holmes, a dental professor. Sherlock Holmes is an eye, ear, nose, and throat diagnostician, and Sherlock Holmes as a dermatologist, right? So this literature regards Holmes as the master diagnostician, using his keen powers of observation and logical reasoning to solve baffling medical mysteries. Medical students are taught, it's a cliche, that if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. But Sherlock Holmes and the kind of superior doctor doctors dream of being always catches the zebras. And just to give you one last example, the peak example in recent popular culture of the doctor as Sherlock Holmes comes when you exchange an Edinburgh, a London, Victorian London crime solving for a New Jersey hospital. Yes, I said New Jersey. Dr. John Watson for Dr. James Wilson and cocaine for Vicodin. And instead of the plural homes, you get the singular house, right? This is a very conscious effort to put a doctor as Sherlock Holmes. And in fact, house actually lives at 221B Baker Street. Okay, so going back to Martland and Sherlock Holmes, okay? There's two examples where Martland went out of his way to explain the difference between himself and Sherlock Holmes and the difference between the real things that he was doing and the fantasy world of Sherlock Holmes. The first takes place in 1937 at the New York Academy of Medicine as part of a series of lectures to the laity on the art and romance of medicine. So Dr. Martland gives a presentation entitled Dr. Watson and Mr. Sherlock Holmes. And the lecture series was published in Martin's chapters, 86 pages. I don't know if he actually read the 86 pages uh, in his speech. I'm not going to be doing that. Um, and although he started the presentation by tracing the evolution, oh, apparently he also wore a deer stalker when he, when he gave this talk at the New York Academy of Medicine. Although he started his presentation by tracing the evolution of the mystery and detective story from Edgar Allan Poe to Arthur Conan Doyle, Martin was not really giving a literary talk. He had two broad points to make throughout his presentation. First, he emphasized, emphasized the gap, really a yawning chasm between fictional mystery solving and real world crime and crime investigation. For example, he noted that in fiction, writers seek new and bizarre methods of bumping off their characters. Yet as for methods used in actual murder, based on his decades of experience, Martland noted that, whoops, did I go too far? Yes, I did. The methods are not numerous. Most of them are quite simple. And while many are bloody, they are, not as a, they are, as a rule, not at all sensational. At the same time, though, Martland also said, the novelists have not even approached the sheer horror which is actually encountered. Perhaps the dead, putrefying, stinking body is a little too nauseating for the delicate, neurotic stomach. This is what he's saying to the audience. The second broad point Martland made in his presentation was that even real-world crime solving demanded professionalization, not Sherlock Holmes amateurism. He attacked the position of coroner. This is again in his 1937 speech. He'd already accomplished the, the real world goal in 1927. He attacked the position of coroner as outmoded and unqualified for death investigations. Because city and county coroners were elected positions beholden to local political machines, they therefore did not attract the best and brightest physicians nor inspire public confidence. And Marland, again, as I said before, had pushed the state of New Jersey to create a system of medical examiners who were appointed physicians with a specialized training in modern forensic science. And so he commented on that. He also said in the speech, uh, with the more modern scientific methods in the detection of crime, police investigators are coming into their own and the character of the private detective is on the way out. In modern criminal investigations, the doctor assumes a different and more important role. And in the medical detection of crime, the physician must play a more important role than that of Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson has been transformed into a medical examiner. And in the scientific detection of crime, Marlin's ideal medical examiner would be intelligent, good background and training, honest, and a ceaseless, tireless, inveterate worker, which also describes Harrison Marlin. And you can get the flavor from Marlin's literary style, such as it was in his description of the job of, uh, in his description uh, of this, which he says, the job of medical examiner was no vacation for a swivel chair pathologist or a writer of library papers or for a long-haired professor who requires a sabbatical leave in Khan or a haven in a marble halled institution of so-called medical research. So that leaves you to understand what, how Marlin felt about uh, basically everybody other than Harrison Marlin to some extent. Um, so that's uh, one time when Marlin went out of his way to give a public talk and so on and, and explain the difference between what he did and the world of Sherlock Holmes. And there's a second example 
um, which takes place, I'll be concluding with this, which takes place on January 3rd, 1947. Um, there's an organization called the Baker, Baker Street Irregulars, which is for sort of super fans of Sherlock Holmes. And in fact, Marlin was one of them, okay? So this is a weird sort of, at the same time that he's drawing the contrast, he's also kind of involved in this world. On January 3rd, 1947, the Baker Street Irregulars met for their annual dinner. Founded by journalist Christopher Morley in 1934, this group is to this day the preeminent Sherlock Holmes Society. And hundreds and hundreds of Sherlock Holmes fans continue to descend on New York City every January. Here's a photo of the 1947 meeting. You'll note that the group was all male until 1991. And to, if I zoom in a bit, here in the center is Dr. Marlin. And this convivial evening included dinner and drinks, Sherlockian toasts, a quiz contest, several kind of free ranging talks, including one on Sherlock Holmes and bureaucracy, and one by famous mystery novelist Rex Stout, the creator of Nero Wolfe, discussing the love life of Dr. Moriarty. Frederick Denet, one half of Ellery Queen, passed out complimentary copies of the February 1947 issue of Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. This sounds like a swell evening, right? Right up until Dr. Martlin concluded the meeting with a presentation entitled On Tattoo Marks. Baker Street Irregulars founder Christopher Morley later wrote a letter about what happened. More gruesome, the payoff came when old Dr. Martland, the medical examiner of the city of Newark, mischievously decided to show up the sentimental lads who pretend they are interested in crime. He dragged in a projection machine about 11.30 p.m. and began to show slides on a screen. Everything had been pleasantly intelligentsia until then. But the doctor, with mentioning a lecho, which is a weird Shakespearean allusion to the word mischief, began to show a panorama of crime as it actually is in a modern city. After a display of two young people, boy and girl, who were dredged up from the river two months after their car had plunged in, and official photos of a girl who'd been raped by some satyr and a suicide who had hanged himself. Thank God it was midnight and I had to run for my latest Oyster Bay train. They were still at it when I left, but it will take me a time and a determination to forget those pictures. So today I've told you about uh, Harrison Martland and his experience with the Radium Girls. I've given you the Newark side of Harrison Martland in his, in his biography. I told you a little bit about his pioneering work on Punch Trunk. And we ended with kind of a free range discussion of Harrison Martland and Sherlock Holmes and comparing the differences between the two. And I hope that none of you will have, have to use a time and a determination to forget what I've told you here today. Uh, and with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Weiss. Thank you. Harry Kaplan, yes. Yes, Kaplan writes an article in the 50s directly refuting the idea that punch drunk exists. Yes, um, so at some point, yeah. Kaplan was, I guess, wound up as a major figure in neurology in New Jersey later in, later in his career. So the question was, um, Dr. Dr. Weiss was asking about Dr. Harry Kaplan. Um, yes, but that's the strange thing is he, the article he writes related to what Martlin is interested in is a refutation of Martlin. But in fact, Martlin was correct. CTE and, and subconcussive trauma really does lead to uh, neurological impairment, unlike what neurologists, I guess, have been ar arguing here and there. Second question, yes. I was with the faculty at, at the New Jersey Medical School for 35 years. And uh, in the other, when I was a medical student, well, excuse me, uh, while I was in, in, in Newark, they, they then renamed at one point, named Martin Hospital Bergen Hospital. And I was on a speaking uh, at a, a arrangement, a relationship with Stan Bergen because I interviewed him for his job. I was in the uh, search committee. So he always had a little bit of respect for me. And after they named the place Bergen, Bergen Hospital, Building. I called him up and I said, Steve, Stan, isn't it enough they name a street after you? You have to name a hospital. <laughs> Bergen's Bergen Avenue and drive by the right, right Of course, front. it had nothing to do with him. And, yeah. And Bergen was, got his own up because 
this administration was ripe with uh, ill uh, got goods and mis mis uh, and uh, misbehavior by people on the board of trustees and they removed this Bergen's name from the hospital and they no, no, also no, it's, dismantled it's the US, University of Medical Medicine and Dentistry that he is so carefully established. It's Thanks the, again for your talk. Thank you. It's still the Stanley S. Bergen building. Everybody calls it SSP. Uh, the upper floors are uh, the chancellor and the administrators of RBHS office. I, I think, and this is a newer question here, I think the top floors of that building are the high point in Newark. It's not the tallest building in Newark, but I think it's the highest point. Because when I've been up there and you look out, you have this great view of the Newark skyline and the New York, New York City skyline behind it. So that's my theory is sort of like that, that rise to the central district. Um, it's really an impressive view. Um, I, I maybe I haven't been in those. <laughs> okay. So Bob, we have a question from online. Uh, did Dr. Markland have direct discussions with the Radium Girls attorney, Lem Grossman? Did they work together on the case at any time? Grossman is the attorney in Illinois. Um, that's a good question. I'll be honest, I don't know. Um, again, I would refer to Kate Moore's book on that, but I think that I think that Martland's legal uh, contact was Raymond Berry, who was the lawyer for the girl, the Radium Girls, the young women in New Jersey. Um, and who apparently, this was a kind of a bold move because it, it, this was, nobody really wanted to take this case and so on. Um, and then in Kate Moore's book, Barry is sort of credited with getting Martland to testify because again, he, he didn't really want to pick a side in this particular case, but he eventually did. Yeah. So I don't know about Grossman. I think, I think Grossman was the attorney in Illinois. I could be wrong. I wonder if you could just talk a little about the relationship with, between Dr. Berg and uh, Dr. Martin. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in the relationship between uh, Ma Martin's experience with the Radium Girls and Berg's experience as uh, one of the doctors that right. went in after uh, Nagasaki. Okay, I don't know enough about Dr. Berg. And in fact, in, in preparing this talk, I was like, I need to go down to the library and just focus on Berg. Um, the Berg family is a fascinating and unusual family. Um, and Berg produces, so the first thing to know about Berg's relationship with Martlin is that 24 years after Martlin died, Berg produced a biography. Berg was not a biographer, he was a doctor. And so as a result, this is a very interesting and somewhat strange book. It's also an incredibly rare book because Berg had it self, it was a vanity press, Vantage Press, kind of a well-known name in vanity presses. This book is really rare. Now, the interesting thing Tim Christ mentioned at the beginning is that Berg willed his estate to Newark Public Library. Uh, and I actually went over to the courthouse and got a copy of it because I wanted to see the, the will. Um, and presumably then all of his materials, including copyright, would be the property of the Newark Public Library. So one of my goals, one of my goals, especially for this upcoming year, is we're gonna put this book back in print one way or the other um, and make it available with the permission of the Newark Public Library um, and, and a scanner and whatever we need to do it. Uh, I'd be happy to write a little introduction because, okay, so what comes through about the relationship between the two men? So the first thing is Berg on the one hand, it's safe, it's safe to say he idolizes Marlon. He, he holds Marlon to a high thing. On the other hand, throughout the book, he points out where Martin's personality and other issues where he wants to sort of point out flaws from the master, if you will. Um, and Martin was not uh, the most huggy, you know, lovable guy. Um, he held grudges. He seemed to have a bit of a strained relationship with his family as the workaholic doctor. Uh, and Berg throws these things in, like Martin didn't know how old his kids were or what grade they were in, you know, stuff like that. Um, and particular accounts. It's an odd book. It's an odd biography. Um, Berg worked directly with Martland for about 30 years. He comes on as an intern sometime in the early 1920s. And Berg's association with uh, Newark City Hospital sort of continues, even though Berg has other positions. I think he has a position on Staten Island, as director of laboratories at a giant tuberculosis hospital on Staten Island. 
but Berg is a Newark guy. That's you know through clear through his donations to to uh, this library and the, the kind of scholarly investigation that he was doing, the kind of work he was doing by walking around and taking a picture of every building in Newark that he could that he could see. So one other fascinating thing about Berg and Martin, the collection that is at my institution, supposedly the story goes, Berg fished it out of the trash. Um, the materials, like I said, that were used by Kate Moore to write a best-selling book and everything else, Samuel Berg rescued them. The entire, what we know about Martin, you know, all this background information and so on. Berg saves Martin's uh, archive. And it's a really remarkable, that aspect alone, I think, speaks to the, the, the esteem, even if, he, even if he sees the flaws, even if he sees the struggle. Um, and Berg in the book, he writes about himself in the third person, he writes I, he writes we. I don't know what's going on with, um, with Berg as a biographer. Um, one last thing about the Berg family, again, is the, the really quirky member of the Berg family is the brother, Mo Berg. The catcher was a spy. There's two biographies. There's also a movie uh, made about um, uh, Mo Berg, the brother, the baseball player. Mo Berg in the movie is played by Paul Rudd, who is 2021 People Magazine's sexiest man alive. The one thing I can guarantee is that the sexiest man alive will not be playing Harrison Marland, Samuel Berg, me, I don't know, you know, maybe Tim Christ, right? But I mean, um, yeah, so it's a very peculiar uh, family. I think there's a story there, and yet I don't know if there's enough material to kind of tell about the interesting aspects of the family. Um, but let me go back on all of that. The upshot of all this is we're going to put Berg's book and make it available in some way, shape, or form where it hasn't really been uh, very publicly accessible. That was a very long answer, right? Okay. Someone made a comment online about the um, closer fictional parallel to a real pathologist detective is John Evelyn Thorndike, or Evelyn Thorndike, who is both physician and jurist. He is the creation of physician writer R. Austin Freeman as sort of successor to Holmes, but relying on actual scientific foundation. Uh, this is a long comment. Now, of course, Thorndike never could claim the flair of Holmes, but I highly recommend the Thorndike novels and short stories, some still in print by Dover and some British publishers and likely online. Uh, Robert, apologies, I have to cut out early to get to the Tuesday night clinic where I volunteer. This is from Stephen uh, Peitzman. Stephen oh, Peitzman. Steve Peitzman. Thanks, very interesting talk. Yes, a, a grandson. Oh. Chris Marlin's joined the, thank you. I, I think I've only emailed him once or twice. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, on the topic of uh, Martlin as medical examiner and how he was uh, instrumental in professionalizing that position, did you, have you come across uh, anything on his connections or, or his collaborations with uh, Morg supervisors and I gather that the Morks uh, at the time were mainly um, they were contractors to the city and uh, some of them were more shall we say responsible than others that's an interesting question um, so um, in looking at Marlin's role there's a there's definitely work to be done more much more work to be done on Marlin Marlin's role as a medical examiner there's not a lot of records in my collection although there are a few that show his mimeograph, like how he made his notes and beryllium poisoning and a few other areas. Um, but one of the things about it is he was clearly very active in the legal world of medicine in Newark. And yet there's really no document, very little documentation. Apparently the medical examiner's office does not have records prior to like the 1980s, which is a real shame because Marlin was, you know, again, kind of a, a leading figure in a nationwide movement to professionalize death investigation. Um, and so there's gaps. And I've wondered again if, you know, if there's newspapers or probably more likely trial transcripts, but how you would go about finding Martin's testimony in, you know, whatever, if you, unless you were going through every murder case or every something where you would expect that there was an autopsy performed or some medical -like evidence to be introduced. Um, so I don't know about also the, the morgue process. I think some of it also was funeral homes actually served as the site of an autopsy. Um, which I think is, I don't know if that's standard or unusual or what, um, and whether that was common at the time or so on. I think there's a little of that in Berg's book where he actually names like, we're going to this funeral home to 
to perform an autopsy or so on. So I don't know again about the morgue situation um, at Newark City Hospital. I mean, Marlon's involved in famous cases, the, the shooting of Dutch Schultz, the death of Dutch Schultz, right, who dies at um, Newark City Hospital and so on and gives this right rambling testimony that's been um, sort of almost treated as a work of avant-garde literature. Um, Marlon would have been present again for an autopsy of, of that. Um, and as well as just other crimes that would have occurred in Newark. Um, where those records are, is there enough there to, to learn more? I don't know. Paula Borenstein is asking, do you know where Dr. Martland is buried? Dr. Martland is buried. I saw it. That's a very unfortunate thing. Um, not in an obvious place in Newark. Um, Somebody just answered. Actually. Somebody answered it yeah. good. To answer your question, he is buried in Maple Grove Cemetery in Hackensack. In Hackensack. Okay. At the very again, at the very end of his life, he he moves in with his uh, daughter and son-in-law in, -law in uh, I think in Riverdale in the Bronx. Um, yeah, I was going to comment also like the house on Broad Street doesn't seem to exist anymore, but there are a couple houses nearby that looked like oh yeah, it was a house that looked something like that. I don't know. For all I know, Sam Berg took a picture of it, right? Um, and then the house at 180 Clinton Avenue. Also, there's a like a wrecked looking house. I don't think it's that address with a you know very you know gables and all kinds of ornate things on it that's falling apart. If you do Google Google Map search, um, the funny story there though is when I looked at it, I was reminded that when Kate Moore came uh, to do her research, she had booked her hotel uh, online. And, you know, I meet her and I'm saying, hey, is everything good? You have a nice hotel? Yeah, it's fine. You know, what hotel are you at? I figured she would be staying someplace by the airport. She's staying at a place called the Hotel Riviera. Right off Clinton Avenue. I'm hearing laughter about this. I asked a colleague from Newark. And I was like, oh, yeah, th this young British woman is staying at the Hotel Riviera. <laughs> and uh, I think once or twice I drove Kate straight from the library to the hotel. I've met other tourists who've made that mistake. Yeah, okay. She had a good time, I evidently, uh, uh, and, uh, and liked the, uh, the, the desk staff and everything else. But I think she, she booked it again from several thousand miles away, didn't know what she was getting into. And it was like literally around the corner from where Marlon lived um, for, for the, most of his life. Are we good? Okay. Thank you. Diego, I hope we can capture the chat and, and get it to Bob. The comments in the chat could not be more positive. Oh, they you. are so grateful. The highest number I spotted was 88 people on Zoom. It's drifted down a little bit from there. So, um, wow. uh, but I'm especially grateful for those of you yes. who uh, showed up here. Um, two things. One. As a way of saying, the Chris Martland, if I uh, apparently the grandson says, excellent presentation, really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Thank you, Bob, and everyone who helped put this together. Thank you. Thank you. But Chris Martland, I'll have to drop you a lot. <laughs> but uh, one person who is not here, who, who has as much knowledge as, as Newark as anybody, is Dan O'Flaherty. I don't know if you've met him. He's a professor of economics at, at Columbia. Um, he says the highest building, the tallest building in uh, in Newark, was the Ivy Hill Apartments. Uh, tall buildings on the highest land before it was uh, torn down in the 70s. Ah, okay. uh, and the nearby Ivy Haven Water Tower was slightly longer. So, yeah. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> the water tower doesn't count. Right? No, you, no, it has so. a good place you can go to and look out on. So, so I think your 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 guess okay. is pretty good. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for joining by Zoom. Uh, our next Newark History Society meeting again will be on September 22nd, uh, made in Newark, uh, the Newark Industrial Exposition of 1872, which was a really big deal. Uh, President Ulysses S. Grant came. It, it was a real showpiece. Guy Sterling, who some of you, well, most of the people in the room know, was, uh, was a journalist at Star Ledger and Ezra Shales, who wrote his own book, Made in Newark. We're borrowing the title, but on a later period about the Newark Museum and such. He's a professor up in Mass. What, where is he a professor? Then? Massachusetts College of Arts. 
Um, so they will be our speakers in September. Then in, 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 uh, for those of us who are members, we may have to limit it because Lonnie Bunch, the director of the Smithsonian Institution will be our guest in conversation with Linda Caldwell Epps at our 20th anniversary program in November in this room. Thank you all for coming tonight. Those of you who are here, grab a, a box dinner and uh, have a good summer and hope to see you in September. Thank you.